Okay, everybody. If you have your Bible, open to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And we'll be looking, uh, we'll be starting in verse 20. Now, as we've uh, looked at for a number of weeks here in our study of 2 Corinthians, uh, Paul was forced to defend himself in Corinth against all the slander and lies being told about him by false apostles uh, in the church. And from chapter 11, verse 22, all the way through chapter 12, verse 19, where we ended a few weeks ago, verse 19, uh, Paul laid out his apostolic credentials, uh, proving to them by his sufferings for Christ uh, and the gospel, uh, by a vision he had of heaven's glory, Uh, by the signs of an apostle that were accomplished through him, that the church in Corinth had witnessed, um, and by his Christ-like love and selfless example before them, that he was the real McCoy, um, a true apostle of Jesus Christ. But as he concluded in um, his defense in verse 19 here of chapter 12, where we left off last time, he let them know that he wasn't defending himself because he felt he needed their approval um, or to be justified before men. As he said, if you look at verse 19 again, here in chapter 12, 2 Corinthians 12, he said again, do you think that we excuse ourselves to you? We speak before God in Christ. Paul knew that the audience that mattered most was God, not man. And so he didn't embark on this lengthy defense of himself and his apostleship uh, before the church in Corinth because he wanted the praises of men. Uh, No, he did it because, as he said in the rest of verse 19, he said, but we do all things, beloved, for your edification. You see, Paul's great concern was to see the church in Corinth become spiritually healthy and built up in their faith in Christ. But that would never happen under the leadership of false teachers and false apostles. And so in order to protect his credibility that the false apostles were seeking to destroy, Paul reluctantly, as we've seen, spoke up on his own behalf in order to expose these men claiming to be apostles for the frauds that they were and bring the church back under his leadership and the sound teaching of God's word and the truth of the gospel. And so Paul's uh, motivation was their edification. I tried to say modification. I'm just making up a new word. (laughs) You guys are hearing it for the first time, aren't you? (laughs) Modification, that's fun. No, motivation was their edification. Uh, He wanted to see them built up in Christ. But again, that wasn't going to happen if they continued um, on the trajectory they were on of listening to the lies and false teachings of the false apostles, and of allowing sinful habits to go on unchecked in their lives and in the church. And thus, the other major emphasis of Paul's letters to the church in Corinth was repentance. Um, As Paul called upon the church in Corinth to repent and to submit their lives to the process of sanctification. Uh, that the Spirit of God longs to accomplish in every believer's life of setting him or her apart from the world and from sin uh, for Christ and for the gospel of Christ. And so, in order to accomplish this, Paul tackled the sin in the church um, head on. You know, in his first letter to them, he, he dealt with the division in the party spirit within the church. As you remember, some of them were saying, well, I'm of Paul, or... I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas, or the super spiritual were saying, well, I'm of Christ. And they were dividing against one another. And in some cases, the divisions were so problematic that they couldn't settle their differences in personal disputes peaceably in the church amongst themselves. And they were suing one another, uh, taking each other to public court, going before unbelieving judges to settle their problems. And Paul said, this is a shame. This ought not be going on. And Paul also dealt with the sexual sin in the church. And he gave instructions concerning marriage and divorce and addressed the abuse of Christian liberty as some of them were using 
their liberty in Christ as a license for the flesh and for sinful living, and with no care or concern for the welfare of other believers. And so Paul had to stress the theme of repentance uh, because repentance is essential to being rightly related to God. Did you know that? Repentance is essential to being rightly related to God. Jesus in Luke 13 chap- chapter, sorry, Luke chapter 13 verse 3 said, "Unless you repent, you will perish." It's the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And you know, just as I had to repent when I initially came to Christ for salvation and forgiveness, so must I continue to do so daily if I am to grow in Christ. Repentance is a lifestyle for a Christian. John MacArthur said, Like faith, repentance is not a one-time act at conversion, but is characteristic of living the Christian life. I like that. Listen to John the Apostle, 1 John 1, 8 and 9. He said, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so the Christian life from start to finish is a life of constant repentance and acknowledgement of sin before God. As we seek daily to turn away from those things that displease God and grieve His Holy Spirit. And again, it's a daily thing. Now let me say this also about repentance. Repentance and penance are not the same thing. And this is important for us to understand because many people, due to the influence of Roman Catholicism upon them, um, have a false perception about repentance and think that all that it really is about is going to confession before a priest, saying a few Hail Marys, uh, doing some works of penance that the priest has prescribed for me, as if I could atone for my sins anyway um, by any work that I might do. I cannot. Only the blood of Christ can atone for sin before God. But you see, many people think that if they do these things that I just mentioned, that all is well, the slate is clean, I've repented. But the problem with that is, number one, one, there's no work or religious ceremony or prescription that can atone for sin. Again, only the blood of Christ can atone for sin. Number two, you could go through that entire ritual without having any real sorrow, remorse, or change of heart whatsoever towards your sin or towards God. And yet walk away falsely believing that all is well because you've done your works of penance. But again, that is not repentance. You see, repentance happens when the Spirit of God brings to your attention those things that you have done. And those things in your heart and in your mind that are offensive to God and that are against His holy law. Which in turn causes you to mourn over those things, to detest those things, to confess them to God, and then ultimately to turn away from them. That is repentance. You see, repentance always involves a change of both the heart and the mind which then in turn affects the will and then the whole course of my life away from sin and towards God. That's repentance. Jesus gave a parable on this. It's called the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Jesus said two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. Now the Pharisee rushed right in. God, I thank you, I'm not like other men. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I possess. Thank you. He said that I'm not like this tax collector over here. But the tax collector, he stood at a distance. He wouldn't raise his face to heaven. But he simply beat on his breast and said, God, have pity on me, a sinner. Jesus said it was the tax collector, not the Pharisee, who went down to his house justified by God. He repented. See, now repentance is essential and it is the evidence of true conversion and genuine faith in Christ. And you know, let me say also this, 
One of the truest tests that a person has repented and understands what it is to repent is that they no longer place their trust in things like penance and religious ceremonies, but have learned to say with the hymn writer, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. You see? They understand that it's faith and faith alone in Christ and what he has done for us that saves us. Now let me say this also about repentance. Scripture knows nothing of a repentance that does not involve turning away from sin. Let me quote to you from Isaiah 55 verse 7. Listen to what the prophet declared there. Isaiah 55 7 Isaiah said, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Now, don't miss the prerequisite to receiving God's mercy, according to the prophet. To receiving a pardon for your sin. As we just read, let the wicked, what? Forsake his way. The unrighteous man, his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and then our God will abundantly pardon. Notice that. You must repent. You want mercy, you want forgiveness, you want salvation, you want God's blessing, you want peace in your heart and in your conscience, you must repent. This is the message of the entire Bible. It's everywhere. But sadly, it's a message that is so often ignored and is very seldomly understood and taken to heart, even in the church. As how many people today think that somehow the terms of the gospel of Christ do not apply to them? Hmm. Or that repentance in their case is optional? Or that they are exempt? Is, that, is not this the rationale being used by so many who have gotten caught up and trapped in the gay lifestyle today? That repentance for them is not necessary? And that they are exempt and are accepted as they are in their sin because as they claim, they were born this way? Even though the Lord Jesus Christ himself has declared, unless you repent, you will perish. But this is a message that so many refuse to listen to and to apply to their lives. They kick against it. And even in the church, people kick against it. And Paul feared that this was the case with the church in Corinth. And that the message of repentance he had so stressed upon them was falling on deaf ears. As he said, if you look here in chapter 12, verse 20 and 21. As he said here, verse 20, For I fear lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I wish, and that I shall be found by you such as you do not wish, lest there be contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, backbitings, whisperings, conceits, tumults. Verse 21, Lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and I shall mourn for many who have sinned before and have not repented of the uncleanness fornication, and lewdness, which they have practiced. Hmm. Paul feared that when he came to visit them again, he would not find them as he wished. That his message did not penetrate. And that sin would still be running rampant and unchecked in some of the members of the church. And Paul said as a result, they would find him to be in such a way that they did not wish. Paul would not wink at their sin. Because God would not wink at their sin. God doesn't wink at our sin. You must repent. This is the message of John the Baptist. The forerunner of Christ. It was the only message he preached. Repent. Get ready. The king's coming. But they weren't ready at his first coming, were they? The majority rejected him. You know the same thing's going to happen at his second coming? Jesus said, it will be a snare to many on the earth. They won't be ready for it. 
the foolishness of man and sin. Doesn't listen to the warnings God gives. You know? And Paul was fearful that this was happening in the church. And that as a result, he would not be able to come to them as he wished. As Paul wished that he could come to them with love in a spirit of gentleness. But instead he would be forced to come and use the rod of church discipline among them. Something he said, you will not wish when it happens. You know? We need to take the warnings of God seriously, guys. We need to take the word of God seriously in our lives. You know? Christ is coming again. But how will you be found by him when he comes? Will you hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant? Enter into the joy of of your Lord, what will you hear that day? Because there will be sheep and there'll be the goats. And Jesus said many would come to him on that day saying, Lord, Lord, did we not do many wonderful works in your name? Lord, I went to church <laughs> every Sunday. I tithed. I was a member. But like that Pharisee in the parable, their hearts were not really ever right before him. And Jesus said that he would say to them, Depart from me, you who work lawlessness. I never knew you. God forbid that that should be said to any of us by him that day. And this is what Paul feared for the church in Corinth. You guys are in the church, you're professing to be believers, but where are your hearts? Why is there all this stuff still going on, he said, among you, unchecked? Why haven't you repented? Don't, do you want me to come with a rod, or do you want me to come with gentleness and love? How do you want it to be? You see, the choice was theirs, and the choice is ours. How do we want things to be? You know? Paul didn't want to have to use his apostolic authority. But if he had to, for the good of the church, for the survival of the church, he would. Because sin kills churches. You know that? That's the real divider. Sin. That's what kills churches. It kills Christians' walks. And sin in our day, it's running rampant everywhere we look. And so few, even in the church, are getting it. And this is exactly what the Bible told us the last days would be like. Paul said that men would depart from the faith. Jesus said the love of many would grow cold. God help us to hear what he's saying to us today. That our hearts don't grow cold towards him. Now, Paul listed some of the sins that were plaguing the church. In the second half of verse 20, he said that when he came, he feared he would find contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, backbitings, whisperings, <laughs> conceits, tumults. You, know. you see, the church in Corinth was selfish. Self-centeredness ruled and reigned among them. And... It was really the selfishness that was the root. What we're reading here is the fruit. This is the fruit of selfishness. Contentions, right? Jealousy, outbursts of wrath, getting angry, losing your temper. Selfish ambition, it's all about me. I want my way, I want my will. I want everybody to listen to me, right? Backbiting, right? You don't listen to me, I'm going to go talk about you behind your back. Whispering. Psst, 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 psst. Hey, did you hear what? No. But that's a terrible church to be a part of. You know? But that's what was happening. And when self is on the throne, that's what you get. But when Christ is on the throne, you get something much different. Well, selfishness wasn't the only problem. As Paul also mentioned, the sexual sin that was present in the lives of some of the members of the church. As he spoke at the end of verse 21 of the uncleanness fornication and lewdness which they have practiced practiced 
Um, and apparently, uh, we're still practicing. Um, now, the Greek word for fornication here is porneia, uh, from which we get our English word pornography. And it refers to any sexual act outside of the marriage covenant between a man and a woman. And oh, how immoral and marked by fornication our society has become. And sadly, this is true also of so many in churches today. Fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. And Paul feared that when he arrived in Corinth also, that he said God would humble him among them. You know, that could also be translated humiliate. As Paul would be humiliated to see this church that he had planted, he had cared for, and whose lives were supposed to be living epistles of Christ, still marked by unrepentant sin. This, this would be a cause, he said, of mourning, deep sadness for him. And he was anxious about it, as any pastor worthy of his calling is. You know? John said, I have no greater joy than to see my children walk in the truth, talking about the Christians he pastored. But on the flip side of that, I have no greater sorrow, a pastor could say, than to see the people living in sin and not getting it. And so I think Paul partly was dreading his next visit to Corinth. And you know, this is, a, this is such a human text right here. The humanity of Paul just spills out all over 2 Corinthians. He shares his feelings. He shares his struggles. He shares what he's going through. It wasn't easy. Part of him was dying inside as he tried to reach this wayward church. But you know, in behaving that way, Paul, and in his call to the church to repent, in many ways mirrored and echoed the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And you know, in the book of Revelation, Jesus had John the Apostle write seven letters to seven different, seven different churches in which he repeatedly called for repentance and warned of the consequences if they would not. Uh, to the church in Ephesus, uh, after commending them for their labor and patience, he said this in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. That's Jesus to the church in Ephesus. Now listen to the church in Pergamos. After commending them for not denying him or denying his name, he said this, Revelation chapter 2, verse 14 to 16. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitan, Nicolaitans, which thing I hate, Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. That's what he said to Pergamos. To the church in Thyatira, after commending them for their service, said this, Revelation 2, verse 20 to 22. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality. And, to, and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. Are you hearing this over and over again? Unless you repent, unless you repent, here's what's going to happen. To the church in Sardis, that in this church on the outside looked as though they were full of life. He said this, Revelation 3, verse 2 and 3, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. 
for I have not found your works perfect before God. There, remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. The last one, to the church in Laodicea. And this was the lukewarm church that had become completely indifferent towards the Lord Jesus Christ. They weren't hot and they weren't cold. They were just whatever. And they said this, I'm rich. I've become wealthy. I don't need anything. But here's what he said to this church. He said, you don't even know that you're wretched. You're miserable. You're poor. You're blind. And you're naked. He said this, Revelation 3, verse 18 and 19. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed, clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. Listen to what he said here. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Did you hear that? Again? Five out of the seven churches that Jesus had John write to needed to repent. You know what that goes to show us? Just how easy it is, even for the strongest of Christians and churches, to drift from God and to fall into sin and into error. And you know, I'm sure that none of these churches or believers ever intended for that to happen. And that they had all started out well in their walk with Christ. And to a degree, they were still doing some things right. As you remember, Jesus commended them for what they did right. But somewhere along the way, they had allowed sin and compromise to come into their lives and into the churches. And they'd grown complacent about it. And they come to the place where they just were allowing it to go on unchecked. Which is why the Lord had John write and send these letters to them in order to deal with the sin going on in their lives and in the churches. Hmm. Now, did Jesus do that because he hated them and wanted them to feel rotten? No. <laughs> he did it because he loved them and because he knows that the greatest hindrance to his blessing and to spiritual growth in the lives of his people is unrepentant sin. Do you know that? It's the greatest hindrance in your life and mine. Refusal to repent, to change towards God and myself. And so for their good and for ours, he had these things written down to warn and correct them and us because of his great love for his church and because of our constant tendency to drift away from him and go back into sin. Again, Jesus said, Revelation 3.19, listen to this, and let this sink down. Jesus said, as many as I love, what do I do? I give him a great big hug. I say, you're doing great, son. Go on and do what you ever you want to do. <laughs> nope. <laughs> as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Did you hear that? That's part of the love of God to you, to me. To rebuke me when I'm wrong. The Bible says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. The world tells you, do whatever you want. Live in sin. Nothing bad's going to happen. And Satan says, yeah, do it. You will not surely die when God says, when you eat of that tree, guess what? You're going to die. When you commit that sin, you're going to die. God tells you in love. Tells me in love. As many as I love, Jesus said, I rebuke, I chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Run away from sin the same way you'd run away from sickness and disease. How many people were so zealous to not get COVID-19, but care nothing about the sin in their lives? Let me ask you that. Be zealous and repent. Sin is the greatest killer. It's killing people for eternity, sending them, them to hell forever. But people aren't repenting. They're not changing. They're going on. 
as if nothing will ever happen. God help us. May we be zealous and repent where we need to in our lives. May God also keep us from the deadly mistake of thinking we are somehow exempt from repentance or that we don't need to repent because we did that X amount of years ago. Or we've done our works of penance or whatever. No, as I said before, repentance is not a one-time thing that takes place at conversion. But it is the lifestyle of every believer in Jesus Christ. It's a lifestyle. And you know, I don't care how long you've been a Christian, how long you've been in the church. You will never reach a point in this life where you have no need of repentance. Did you know that? Never. I'm always repenting. I'm daily repenting. I'm daily asking God to help me, to change me, to soften my heart. To cleanse me of my sins. May God help us to keep short accounts with him. You know, lest we become like the church in Corinth. And these other churches in the book of Revelation our Lord addressed. Lest we become callous. Lest we become accustomed to sin. And lest we fall into the dangerous possess- position of receiving ultimatums from the Lord. As the Lord said to these churches, if you don't repent, I'm going to come and I'm going to take away your lampstand. I'm going to remove my blessing from you. In fact, the church in Laodicea, he was on the outside knocking in, knocking on the door to come in. May God keep us from such a place. And may we labor to keep our hearts open and soft before God. And if we need to repent, May we do so today and not delay so that the blessing of God may continually flow to our lives through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that you are the God who tells us the truth, Lord. As you said to the church in Laodicea, as many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. Be zealous and repent. Lord, we want to repent. We want to walk rightly with you, individually and as a church, Lord. We want our hearts to be soft, Lord. We want to be open to your voice, what you're saying to us, Lord. We don't want it to be said of us that having eyes we saw not, having ears we heard not, Lord. May we not be unbelieving, but may we be believing, Lord. I ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen.